in this video we're going to summarize the rules of naming ionic and covalent compounds along with some examples. So anytime you're naming a, a given formula, whether it's an ionic compound or a covalent compound, you must ask some questions to yourself as you're going to be moving along and categorizing it into the covalent compound or an ionic compound. So the very first question you always ask yourself, if it, the given compound is covalent or ionic, okay? So if you have only nonmetals, so nonmetals in a given compound, then you are falling into the category of an covalent compound. So when you have an covalent compound, the rule you use to name the covalent compound is by having the prefixes. So another way of saying there is no positive and negative in the covalent compound and uh, to specify how many of the atoms you have in a given compound you use prefixes such as di, tri, tetra and so on. Okay so that's for the covalent compound. What if you have an ionic compound and the question you ask yourself in order to categorize a given compound into an ionic form if it contains an, a cation and anion. Alright so that's going to be if it has a cation and the anion. And obviously we know your cations are coming from the metals and your anions are coming from the nonmetals. And you, the nonmetals could be, uh, or it could be the polyatomic anions. Uh, I do want to mention there are going to be times when your cation does not come from the metals only. Uh, but rather it comes from an ammonium ion. So even the ammonium ion contains only nonmetals, but it's still in a cation. So the compound the ammonium ion makes with any anion is still going to be considered an ionic compound. So that's the only only exception you have in there. In the other cases, all the cation comes from the metals except obviously the ammonium. Okay. Now, once you figure out that you actually do have an ionic compound, the next question you want to ask yourself where the metal is coming from. If your metal is from uh, group 1A or 2A or 3A, so another way of saying you have a metal with a fixed charge. And that's very important to ask yourself. If the metal is has a fixed charge, then when it comes to naming the compound, you write down the name of the cation, and then you write down the name of the anion, and that's it. Don't do anything else, just the name of the cation and the name of the anion. However, if your metal is coming from the transition metals or transition elements, so another way of saying, if you have a transition metal, which they which they have variable charges, in those cases you have to actually specify the charge on the metal using the Roman numerals. Uh, there is not much a big difference in terms of naming those type of ionic compounds. All you really have to do, you make sure you specify the charge on the cation in the Roman numeral to so specify the charge on the cation. So uh, you still write down the name of the cation, you still write down the name of the anion, but in between you write down the Roman numeral in the parentheses like I have here, and that Roman numeral will tell you what the charge is going to be on the cation. It's not the number of cation, it's the charge on the cation. This is a very common mistake students, mistake, students make where they take this Roman numerals as the number of cations. It's not the number of cations, it's the charge on the cation. So that's the overall summary of these rules. So let's, let's use those rules and apply to some of these examples. Okay, let's look at uh, this first question, which is uh, sulfur tetrafluoride. So this actually has the name, so the question here would have been, okay, what's gonna be the formula? So since this is uh, the name given, the first thing you want to actually figure out if it's an ionic or covalent compound. And remember these prefixes like we have in here, tetra is only used in 
covalent compound. So this is actually going to be a covalent compound. And uh, there's nothing in front of sulfur. There's no prefix in front of the sulfur. So that means we only have one sulfur. And then there is tetra means four. So you got four fluorides, or that means four fluorines. And there's just going to be SF4 for this particular one. Okay, so keep in mind you keep asking yourself questions whether you're putting this into a category of a covalent or an ionic compound. And it becomes more important when you're actually writing down the name from the formula. Okay, this next one, which is cobalt 2 phosphate, obviously, cobalt is your metal, and it actually gives it away since you have this uh, Roman numeral 2 here that means it's a ionic compound and it's an ionic compound with the transition metal so in this case what's going to be the charge on cobalt so remember the cobalt could have variable charges because it's in a transition element but then remember this number that you're going to have in the parentheses actually tells you what the charge going to be so this two is actually the charge on the cobalt all right keep in mind it's not it's not the number of cobalts, it's a charge on the cobalt. So it's a CO2 plus, and your phosphate is going to be PO4, 3 minus. Okay, so now it's all about putting it together. So when you're putting them together, uh, I want to make sure I can balance out the positives and negative. So if I have three cobalts and two phosphate, I should be able to balance out all the charges because three cobalts will give you six plus and two phosphates will give you six minus so that should balance out everything there so then when you put it together I would have CO3 and then I'll need to have two phosphates so PO4 and remember anytime you're writing multiple polyatomic ions you must write in the parentheses, so it's going to be PO4, and then you write down 2 outside the parentheses, so that's going to be cobalt 2 phosphate. Okay, let's look at this next one. We have aluminum nitride. Okay, well, aluminum is your metal, that's going to be AL, and your nitride is going to be the non-metal, and it's coming from uh, the nitrogen, obviously. Remember, most of your anions that ends with ide comes from uh, strictly from the periodic table except the cyanide and the hydroxide so it's going to be the nitrogen now the next thing you want to figure out what the charge is going to be on them then well what's the charge going to be on aluminum is aluminum does aluminum have a fixed charge well the answer is yes it's in group 3a and group 3a metal is going to have a 3 plus charge it's going to be 3 plus there and what's the charge going to be on nitrogen here well it's going to be 3 minus because it's in group 5A and it's 3 electrons away from the noble gas. If you have a hard time figuring out what the charge is going to be, make sure you watch another video that I have posted just on the ionic compound in detail. And that also tells you how the, how the cations and the anions are made and how you determine their charges based on the location of the periodic table. So... Since you have a 3 plus on the aluminum and 3 minus on the nitrogen, you just need one of each to balance out the charges. So it's just going to be ALN in this particular case. Okay, well, let's look at the next one, which is TiO2. So I got this titanium, and then I got two oxygens. I can probably just write those down right next to one another. Uh, now, is this going to be ionic or covalent? Well, when I look at... Uh, the titanium, titanium is actually a metal, so it's going to be an ionic compound. And more or less, titanium is a transition metal. So since it's a transition metal, it's going to have variable charges. So how do you figure out the charge on the transition metal when in a given compound? Uh, recall, we rely on the anion. So we have to rely on the anion in this particular case. Our anion are going to be made from the oxygens. So since you have oxygen, that's going to make an oxide. And what's the charge on the oxide? Well, oxygen is in group 6A, so it, it's two electrons away. So it's going to gain two electrons to get to the noble gas. So each of those oxygens will have two minus charge. So that gives you an overall of four minus charge. So that means you must balance that four minus 
by the 4 plus. So since titanium is only by itself, it's going to have a 4 plus charge on it. So now I know the charges on those and I can write down the compounds. So remember, if this is an ionic compound with the transition method involved, you write down the name of the cation and you write down the name of the anion. But in addition to that, you specify the charge on the cation in the Roman numeral. So don't forget those rules. So titanium 4 oxide. Okay, so that's going to be the formula for that. Okay, let's look at this next one, PCL3. Okay, so is this going to be ionic or co uh, covalent? Well, your phosphorus is a nonmetal and your chlorine is a nonmetal, so you have uh, nonmetals only in this particular case. And since you have nonmetals in there, that's going to be the covalent compound here. Okay, so since it's in a covalent compound, you don't use, there's no positive and negative, you just assume the very first nonmetal as in a cation and very second nonmetal as an anion. So in this particular case, phosphorus stays in a phosphorus, and since it's only one, you don't have to write down mono or di or anything like that. So phosphorus, and since you have three chlorine, this chlorine is going to become chloride, but since you have three of those, you want to say trichloride. All right, so if you have a hard time writing these, make sure you watch the video that, in, that entails the naming of covalent compound in details. Okay, so then finally this Na2O uh, with sodium is a metal and oxygen is a non-metal, so that's going to be an ionic compound. So since it's an ionic compound, uh, the next question you want to ask yourself, does sodium have a fixed charge or a variable charge? Well, sodium is actually in group 1A and it's going to have a fixed charge. So since sodium has a fixed charge, uh, you know it's going to be Na1+, and you have two of those, and you got the oxygen to be an oxide here, which is going to be 2 minus. So if you have a fixed charge, all you really do is write down the name of the cation and the name of the anion. So name of the cation here is going to be sodium, and the name of the anion is just going to be oxide. So you don't write any Roman numerals in this particular case. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, you use prefixes in covalent compound, you use uh, Roman numerals anytime you have an ionic compound with the transition method involved, and you don't write any Roman numerals anytime you have an ionic compound with metals that have fixed charges. All right, so hopefully this was helpful, and if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments below.